Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Building Resilient Home Healthcare with Energy Storage. This webinar is presented by the Resilient Power Project, which is a joint initiative of Clean Energy Group and Meridian Institute. We have a number of excellent speakers with us on the line today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few very quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can connect using your computer, mic, and speakers, or you can call in using a telephone. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console, you can use the little orange arrow that you see circled, and that arrow also works to expand the webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and your comments throughout the webinar by typing them into the questions box in the webinar console and hitting send. We will get to as many questions as we can. We're going to save about 15 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. And to make sure that we get to your question, do type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording within 24 to 48 hours, possibly as early as this afternoon. And we'll also be posting the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. So with that out of the way, I would like to pass it over to our host for today's webinar, Marielle Mango. Mari is a program associate here at Clean Energy Group, and she will be introducing our webinar and our other guest speakers and talking a bit more about um, our topic for today. Mari? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. My name is Mari Mango. We are um, here to talk about the resilient power for home health care that Clean Energy Group has been working on since, and we are in our recently published paper, Home Care in the Dark. Our panelists today includes Kristen Finn from the Empower program, Annie Shapiro from the Meridian Institute, and Moraldi, who worked on a project in Puerto Rico on solar and storage. The Resilient Power Project is a project through the Clean Energy Group and Meridian Institute to increase public and private investment in clean, resilient power systems protect low-income and vulnerable communities with a focus on affordable housing and critical public facilities, engage city, state, and federal policymakers to develop supportive policies and programs. If you'd like to uh, learn more, please visit our website for more information and resources. These are a couple of the projects that we've supported through the Resilient Power Project. We have over 100. Some of the ones that we thought worthwhile highlighting today, including our work in Puerto Rico, supporting the installation of solar and storage at over more than 60 medical clinics, as well as affordable housing properties, both in DC and California, which provide solar and storage to low income or otherwise vulnerable populations in the event of an outage. Again, here are our panelists here today. Moraldi is working in the Department of Electrical Engineering in the University of Washington. Kristen Finn with the Empower Program. She's the director through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Annie Shapiro, Program Institute at, Meridian Insti uh, at the Meridian Institute, and myself with the Clean Energy Group. I'm going to throw it over to Annie, and she's going to begin our presentation today. Thanks, Mari, and thanks everyone for joining us on this webinar. Um, today, we're going to be providing just a, a brief overview of trends within home health and home care regarding backup power. We'll also be identifying some opportunities for solar and storage to better protect medically vulnerable individuals from the dangerous impacts of power outages. And I'll also just say that a lot of the information we're going to cover during this presentation is captured in a new report that we just published that Mari mentioned called Home Health in the Dark. So we encourage you to read it if you'd like to go deeper on any of the points we mentioned today. So during our presentation, we're just gonna take about 10 minutes total to discuss some key topics. First, we'll say a little bit about recent trends within home healthcare and power outages across the country. Then we'll discuss the importance of resilient, long-lasting power supplies for electricity-dependent individuals and the opportunities that solar and storage promises for that demographic. We'll also touch on the impact and demographics of who's most at risk during a power outage outline some existing solutions that we see to get these people prepared for power outages, 
and we'll also finish up with a quick overview of some recommendations we see in the near and long term. So across the country, more people are choosing to receive healthcare at home than ever before. This trend can be attributed to multiple factors. I think the first is that the industry continues to innovate technologically, which is providing more opportunities to get the care that patients need in their home. In addition, as the baby boomer generation ages, there are more people that are aging into Medicare and need, in need of health care. So this population is actually expected to, to double by 2060. As people age, they're not only becoming less healthy, but also the cost of their medical care is increasing. So currently, two-thirds of all Medicare home health beneficiaries have four or more chronic conditions or functional impairments. And dementia related to Alzheimer's disease is also contributing to that trend. So there's actually quite limited data about just how many people rely on electricity to power life-sustaining equipment in their homes, whether that's a stair lift to get them up and down the stairs or medical equipment. What we do know is that there's a minimum of 2.5 million people across the U.S. that rely on electricity to power their medical devices. Most of that population are senior citizens over the age of 65, but we also know that millions more are using electricity for home care services, including children. So not only is demand for home health increasing, but also the frequency and duration of power outages are also increasing across the country. In 2018, power outages almost doubled, and this can be attributed to our country's aging grid infrastructure, but also extreme weather and new utility shutoffs, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Power outages are also lasting longer. Um, five months after Hurricane Maria decimated Puerto Rico's energy infrastructure, 400,000 people still remain without power. And as I mentioned, utilities in California are now starting to implement public safety shutoffs across the state in an effort to minimize the risk of a catastrophic wildfire that could be caused by something like a fallen transmission line. So as extreme weather persists, these utilities are cutting off power preemptively to prevent a disaster from occurring, and this clearly has some pretty serious implications for the state's many electricity-dependent residents. So the impacts of power outages are quite apparent for anyone that has experienced even a minor power outage in a disruption. But for those of you that know family members or loved ones that rely on electricity to power their medical equipment, you understand the, the fear and the, the confusion that really develops when their one lifeline disappears on them. For many, the combination of natural disasters and medical conditions is quite deadly. If you look at what happened with Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, Healthcare complications in the case of Hurricane Maria accounted for one third of the deaths following the hurricane. And in the case of Hurricane Irma, 15% of the deaths were attributed to power outages that worsened existing medical conditions. So truly the loss of power is a life-threatening emergency for medically vulnerable individuals, as well as those that rely on mobility equipment to maneuver within their homes and evacuate safely. Of course, you know, it's important to note that there are resources in place to protect these people from power outages and one of those most commonly utilized resources are generators. So I'll turn it over to Marielle to explore this technology and discuss some ways that solar and storage can mitigate some of the challenges that we face. Thanks, Annie. Generators have been the go-to backup power solution for a long time now. 80% uh, of the global generator market was diesel generators. Unfortunately, diesel generators come with just a host of problems, and they've become kind of accepted problems in the industry and really don't have to be. Generators require frequent refueling. They often emit pollutants. They are prone to failure. Generators are not meant to be used 24-7, and um, can that can lead to failure. And they can be difficult to operate, especially for uh, elderly or otherwise um, medically vulnerable populations, people who are weak or have issues um, with mobility, it's very difficult to, to properly operate a generator. Additionally, we consistently see spikes in um, carbon monoxide poisoning after natural disasters directly related to generator use. 80% of fatal disaster-related CO2 poisonings can be directly attributed to improperly using a generator. The problems that we really um, accept here as industry standard just shouldn't be. The technology exists to offer resilient, uh, reliable residential backup power that's separate of gas or diesel generators. Sorry, just here we go. Um, 
And that solution is resilient power. Battery storage is a reliable and clean energy solution that comes with without the host of uh, issues that generators have. In the event of an outage, a battery storage unit can automatically island or disconnect from the grid to provide continued power throughout an outage. It does not emit pollutants. There's not the same uphill maintenance and understanding of how to actually use it, where it goes in your home, it's installed. Um, you can It can deliver electric bill savings, especially when it's combined with PV. And when it's combined with solar PV, you can operate much longer than uh, an average generator without requiring refueling. We did want to highlight here the lack of fuel really not being an issue because we're increasing increasingly seeing fuel shortages after natural disasters. After Hurricane Florence, 56% of gas stations in Wilmington, North Carolina were without fuel. So if you're already having issue, financial issues affording to refill your generator, and then on top of that, you have the issues associated with a shortage, um, resilient power really, battery storage especially, really overcomes those hurdles. I like to highlight the McKnight Lane development project because it's a great example of how um, low-income and otherwise vulnerable populations can access solar and battery storage and what it actually looks like in their homes. For this particular project, Resilient Power was installed in modular affordable housing um, units in rural Vermont. Each one had their own solar and battery storage system. The system automatically disconnects from the grid in the event of an outage, providing power to everyone in their homes. And the solar panels and batteries provide electricity, and it's actually anticipated that 100% of the tenants' electricity needs are actually being met through the solar and storage system, which is a great additional economic benefit beyond resilient power. Thanks, Mari. So where do people go when the power goes out? Um, those that are in the position to evacuate, which often means securing and navigating the transportation to be able to do so, pretty much evacuate to emergency shelters or hospital emergency rooms. In fact, hospital records show that respiratory device failures actually account for a significant amount of the emergency room visits and hospitalizations during emergencies. The influx of home health patients to hospitals during emergencies can be quite disruptive for hospitals that are already dealing with major logistical and operational challenges that are associated with disasters. It's also quite expensive for hospitals themselves to care for these individuals. In the case of um, Hurricane Irma, disaster-related costs for Texas ho hospitals were estimated at $460 million. So those that don't go to emergency rooms or shelters often seek out community facilities such as schools, churches, um, and other community gathering places. Really, the power of social community should not be underestimated here because those that have connections to the community are much more likely to understand the options for emergency response and evacuation, and those that do not are much more likely to shelter in place. So the de decision to shelter in place can be difficult and dangerous because the reality is that even despite warnings and disaster preparedness programs, medically vulnerable households are only marginally more likely to evacuate prior to an emergency. Alerts identifying impending outages are not always effective in ensuring residents actually leave their homes, and evacuation during or immediately after an emergency can take time and be quite dangerous. So providing electricity-dependent residents with the ability to safely shelter in place by ensuring that they have access to resilient backup power is really important and can start to mitigate some of the adverse impacts of power outages on these, on these individuals. So there are existing solutions at play to try to protect these people from the adverse impacts of power outages. Existing emergency management programs such as registries and emergency preparedness checklists are fantastic resources, but they tend to focus more on evacuation rather than resilience and self-sufficiency. In our experience, they're also not likely to discuss backup power options. If they do, they're likely to discuss diesel generators, but not provide information about how one could access those systems. They also don't currently provide information about the range of other backup power systems that are available, such as solar and storage. Of course, in many situations, evacuation is really the only safe option and resilient power is of little help there. But for all other situations, there's this important gray middle ground about ensuring that people have the necessary information that they need to improve their preparedness, starting first and foremost with making sure they have a battery backup system in place for all emergencies that don't necessitate an evacuation. 
Thanks, Annie. So, so we wanted to go through just a couple of the solutions. These are um, a more broad overview of what we've included in the, the paper, but ultimately what it comes down to is that hospitals and in some states other critical facilities like nursing homes and dialysis centers are required to have backup power available in the event of an outage. That uh, has not expanded to the home health care industry where people can stay at home, receive their health care almost exclusively at home, and not need um, backup power to do so. And you can go to the next slide. Great. So one of the things we wanted to touch upon is market development. And what goes hand in hand with this is also research and data. We didn't uh, go too deep into this because Kristen and our other panelists will be touching on it, but we really don't have, um, public health is not prioritizing research into the demographics of the entire population that is impacted by power outages. Market development goes hand in hand with that. There isn't really a technological innovation right now that's tailored to the home medical industry, and there needs to be. We need to be uh, building awareness and a new consumer base so that solar and storage providers can actually have a product that they can provide to people based on their medical equipment and, and their individual needs so that people aren't unnecessarily buying systems that are too large for what they require um, and help drive the cost down. Federal and state policy as well. As I said, state mandates already have emergency power in a lot of critical facilities. They should be incentivizing solar and battery storage in those facilities. In Florida, when they required battery, uh, pardon me, um, generators after the heat wave that resulted in the tragedy of a local nursing home, they are requiring backup power, but there are no incentives in place or even general promotion of resilient power. Disaster relief funds, we really like to highlight Puerto Rico here because they're anticipating over 400 million in community development block grant funds to be earmarked specifically for residential and business solar and store storage, and 75 million for community resilience. This is a great way to ensure that you're actually building resilience into recovery plans. And then lastly, expanding on Medicare and Medicaid and, and private insurance as well, and including battery storage as a piece of durable medical equipment that doctors can prescribe as is necessary as the oxygen concentrator that it would be attached to. Finally, utilities. Utilities have a great economic benefit to gain from installing residential solar and storage. We like to highlight here Green Mountain Power because they've had a very successful program here in Vermont. Over 2,000 customers received battery storage units in their home and 100 of those customers who are low income and medically vulnerable receive the systems for free and at no charge. In this instance, the customer has the benefit of getting resilient power in the event of an outage, which happens quite a bit here, severe weather in Vermont, and the utility gets the benefit of managing peak energy demand and reduces costs for all customers at the end of the day. So thank you for being here today. We're gonna throw the report over to Kristen, who's gonna go through a little bit about the Empower program. Great, thank you. We can just skip to the next slide. So I'm Kristen Finney. I'm in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the, U um, the Department of Health and Human Services, at the, basically a federal agency. Um, you, uh, sorry, advanced through, yeah. So how, oh, go back. <laughs> so one of the um, challenges that we've seen in the progression and basically what the Office of the Assistant Secretary does for HHS in concert with FEMA is we're responsible for coordination of all public health and medical impacts in any disaster. So HHS is the lead agency in that in response to FEMA that does the overarching management, but we carve out that piece and we're responsible for that piece. And then we car we basically coordinate across all of our other sister agencies, both sister Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CDC, FDA, National Institutes of Health, et cetera. We have many different agencies, SAMHSA, et cetera. So one of the things that we had seen in an escalating trend, uh, particularly in the last 14 years that I've been doing response since Katrina, but particularly going into Hurricane Sandy, was that public health officials and emergency managers nationwide had saw this trend, basically, of individuals rapidly showing up in overwhelming um, hospitals, um, as well as shelters, as well as overwhelming emergency medical services and 911 centers for calls for assistance. And those individuals were electricity dependent, medical equipment dependent individuals, particularly those that are older adults or disabled and such. And what we saw was more and more of these were happening and it was 
re resulting from positive trends and changes of policy that were looking to, instead of having individuals live in residential facilities in the past, possibly 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even some recent, would normally have been in a long-term care facility if they had electricity-dependent equipment needs, such as an oxygen concentrator or a ventilator or um, central feeding or other types of assistive equipment, they would normally have been in those residential facilities. But now, based on um, policy and also advancing technology, individuals are allowed to live independently in their home for the most part, with some having a loose caregiver network around them and such. So they're fine and they go about their life and they have positive outcomes by living in their community because that's where they're happier. However, once there's a power outage or a disaster that results in widespread or prolonged power outages, these individuals are immediately thrust into life-threatening situations. And much of this also comes from the challenge that is Many of these people are using equipment that is actually hospital grade equipment because the device industry hasn't really caught up to this new kind of service and weren't really tracking it because the orders that come through come through. Doesn't matter if it's a hospital or a provider going to a home. So as a consequence of that, many of these equipment have very short batteries or no batteries at all because in essence they were assumed to be a hospital grade piece of equipment and thus would be able to access a red outlet if you see them in hospitals that are connected to the generator unfortunately these individuals in homes don't have them they don't have a red outlet in their home and they don't many times even realize that they have a short backup battery or no backup battery in their pieces of equipment ultimately what everybody does is that they immediately know based on you know what we always say is they in an event of an emergency they quickly dial 911 and then seek assistance in a hospital because generally hospitals people know that they have some sort of power and ultimately what's happening is you have an individual that doesn't have a medical need for a hospitalization or such but they wind up in an emergency department just seeking access to um, consistent or reliable power to assist them and this overwhelms the emergency medical service. It overwhelms hospitals. Hospitals then try and get individuals to go to shelters. Shelters become overwhelmed because really nobody understood the number of individuals that were in their community. They just saw this rising trend and they're struggling to actually address the need. And ultimately, after numerous disasters, and particularly after Hurricane Sandy, the request was, you know, can you help us understand this? We don't have data, we don't have information, we don't know where they're coming from, we didn't know these individuals lived in our community, and we don't know what to do in this late generation now need of electricity for technology, how to handle this and how to address this in the current environment. So is there any way that you and the federal government can help us? Well, in the federal government, we have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under U.S. Department of Health, and CMS actually funds and ensures the Medicare program, which covers um, over 54 million Americans every day um, through multiple different programs, both through the fee-for-service program that people are familiar with and also the Medicare Advantage program. So one of the questions we asked was, is it possible for us to be able to leverage our administrative claims data in a timely and accurate way to be able to actually um, provide these services and information to a public health authority so they could actually potentially anticipate the needs of these individuals and plan for them and possibly even in the worst situation possibly find them and as a consequence of that we started to look at whether or not we could leverage machine learning ai technology and such um, kind of ahead of the curve of everybody else and figure out what those algorithms would be and we actually did and this started literally right after Hurricane Sandy because there was numbers of individuals that were oxygen concentrated dependent that actually passed away because their power died and such. And what we decided to do was see if we could leverage this. It took us changing in policy at CMS and it took over like 27 lawyers to do so, but we quickly said, how could this data potentially become a life-saving resource in the event of an emergency? And we actually conducted a uh, first in the nation exercise in June of 2013 in the city of New Orleans and actually conducted um, an analytic to find individuals that had a ventilator or an oxygen concentrator. Ultimately, we found 611 across eight different zip codes and we conducted outreach to them to see is that data timely and accurate enough? Is it, is Mrs. Smith at her house and does she have a piece of equipment? And ultimately, 93, 4% of the time, she was there with a piece of equipment and she was 
and and they were Kristen? very much. Sorry, yeah. it's Marielle. We're just getting a couple comments of people having a tough time hearing you. Is there any way you could oh. just move maybe the mic back a little bit? Sure. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry about that. So ultimately, um, we actually identified that we could do this. The data was timely and accurate enough. That would be um, something that would be trustworthy by responders to be able to use this and to be able to anticipate needs. But one of the challenges that came with that is also using protected health information in the event of a disaster that would necessitate life-saving assistance. But we really needed to plan for them ahead of time because what we're talking about is planning for a unique set of needs now in the community and really identifying almost a new social determinant of health, which is electricity dependence, in the community. But we also, in doing so, learned a lot of other challenges that we had for a couple of other wraparound healthcare services that are for home-based care. And that included those that were on oxygen tank services, those that are in outpatient dialysis facilities um, that receive treatment three, three times a week, home health care services that are delivered in the home in the home environment, and also even hospice because they have very unique challenges in the disaster. So when we actually started to add this and we expanded the electricity dependent equipment, we expanded out the 14 different types. And that includes everything from ventilators and concentrators and BiPAPs to enteral feeding machines and IV infusion to home dialysis, and as well as electricity mobility equipment such as wheelchairs, scooters, and also electric beds. And ultimately what we found is we run this analytic every month, and every month controlling for multiple pieces of equipment, so nobody is um, included more than once. The total number of Medicare beneficiaries with those 14 types of equipment for healthcare services and or those self for healthcare services is 4.1 million Americans. 2.5 million of them are electricity dependent, relying on one of those pieces of equipment that I talked about. So if we can advance to the next slide. So what we realized very quickly also, we were shocked by the size of the population. We did not believe that it was going to be as big as it was, but it is. And now it really kind of drove home the challenges that we would have because this population continues to increase. Our empowered um, population increased by over 200,000 in the new enrollment period in this past December. So the other thing that's important is that we realize is that it's not just public health that may be challenged with this, but emergency managers, it really is a multitude of individuals and partners that have to come to the table to really address the needs of the electricity dependent population. Everywhere from public health that, you know, they're healthcare compliant, they along with the HIPAA, they can have this data, but more important, they have to work with their emergency managers and their first responders, that is sheriffs, fire department, emergency medical services, and more. But even in National Guard in large disasters, they will be doing some sort of outreach. We need to work with the public utilities and the partners in the energy industry to build awareness and understanding, as well as volunteer organizations that shelter and do a lot of support services and disasters as well as those human services like transportation and other types of things that actually help people get to and from their dialysis treatment, et cetera, and as well as hospitals, because hospitals tend to continue to get this surge when in effect they're trying to create capacity to be able to handle the acute injury and illness that comes in a disaster. And therefore we need to find an alternative, a safe place for individuals to be, whether that's in a sheltering situation or in some cases where there might be a shorter time that this prolonged power outage might be only three or four days. Is there an opportunity to look at ways that the um, energy sector and such can innovate to enable those individuals to safely shelter in place for that period of time by having a reliant piece of um, power to their equipment and such. We can fast forward to the next slide. So ultimately what we did was we realized learning from this is that one, the entire public didn't know about the electricity dependency challenge. Um, I participated in a couple of initial meetings the energy sector in about 2014, even at the White House, and they were shocked. They were shocked by the number of individuals that were living in the community. And one of the things that we learned during our New Orleans exercise, which was later replicated in upstate New York as well, in Broome County, where we had the exact same outcomes, and about 94% were had their piece of equipment, um, is the other thing that we found is that many of those individuals were not on the electric company's registry. In New Orleans, only eight of the 611 were included. 
And one of the things that we found was a challenge was health literacy challenges that the population have. Many of them will refer to their equipment in different terms, like a breathing machine for a ventilator. And that is assumed by others to be an asthma machine and they didn't qualify. Um, so one of the challenges we do have is we really are less supportive of registries because we continue to see this challenge where the language is not used correctly, um, there's not a good outcome, it's not connected to the provider community who are actually writing the prescriptions and getting the initiation of the process of the power, um, the electricity dependent equipment to the patient, et cetera. So there's been a significant gap in connecting with that population and just by general awareness. So during our exercise, we were actually, you know, building awareness on a number of people and also finding out also those that had tried to get on and had those challenges. So that's one thing I encourage everybody when you're looking at your registries is to understand that there is health um, challenges, health literacy challenges, language challenges, et cetera. And also understand what your registry is for. In many cases, it's presumed and assumed that it is for power restoration prioritization, and it's not. It's for notification if you're doing work on the line. So that's another challenge that we had. So in partnering with the community, what we actually ultimately developed was, first and foremost, is our HHS Empower Map that you can actually go to. It's a publicly available. You can click on the link um, and identify at the state, territory, county, and zip code level how many electricity-dependent individuals live in your community. Um, these are Medicare beneficiaries. They're not everybody. We do have those that are um, on Medicare and also enrolled in the Medicaid program. We do not have Medicaid only yet. We don't have VA yet. We don't have DOD or other privates. But we do have a good large portion, um, we're confident in that, of the at-risk population that are electricity dependent. We know this is going to continue to grow, though. We are actually conducting pilots with states that volunteer to actually look at this data in their own state operated Medicaid and also children health insurance programs to see how many more individuals they may can find and that way they can have a robust understanding. Um, we also make the data on the Empower Map publicly available. So if you have a, your own GIS application, you can click on the REST Service Public um, link and that would actually help you be able to consume it three steps and you're able to consume it. The Empower Map has a resource section that you can find job aids on doing all of those things. Um, we also created, because we needed more tailored information and also for the health services data that's not public um, for specific competitive reasons and such in CMS, um, we create a monthly data set that goes out to our public health authorities who they in turn work with their um, partners across all the different other sectors to be able to do targeted planning scenarios and therefore they have more specific information related to um, the types of equipment and such that they can then make um, uh, plans and such to address those specific needs based on resources. And then the other thing that we have is that I call it kind of the break glass. In the event of a disaster um, or an imminent disaster, a public health authority can contact us, um, preferably through the state, um, and request an official disclosure for to support life-saving assistance or response outreach health and wellness checks of individuals in the event of a disaster. So in that case that we have it. And what you see on the map here is many different types of scenarios and disasters and types of disasters across the country. And we have more in the Midwest that we're going to be filling and updating this map with that have used this data for planning purposes as well in response purposes to help save and protect health, but also save lives. I'm going to get a little bit into that. Next slide. So how do we use this? So in essence of like how would you use this data? And if we just looked at the de-identified data alone, the ways that you can leverage this information is by one, anticipating that we know that these individuals will likely call or likely go to call 911 or go try and get to a hospital, we'll anticipate ahead of time that there is surge and start to have an approach to triage them to an alternate safe location ahead of time. Also have a communications plan to educate individuals where they can go that would be safe for them if they're electricity dependent and have specific health needs. And it also enables our partners, uh, emergency managers, telehealth, and first responders to start really kind of developing targeted plans and systems and processes and triggers, figure out where they have gaps and resources, identify optimal locations for those shelters because many times they just took what they had and 
S and SEWA would have a shelter that's far away from their electricity dependent population, which causes a strain on them and resources and evacuation, whereas they may be able to find a location that's closer and minimize that impact or disruption. Also anticipating accessible transportation needs and what these individuals may need on the process of being able to evacuate. And also, more importantly, is also looking at power restoration prioritization. In the past, it's how many people yelled the loudest and fastest. Um, and now the question is whether or not you use this as a factor in saying, you know, stabilizing your vulnerable populations in the community faster really does help the community and help them with their recovery and resilience by minimizing disruption to them. Next slide. So how have we kind of used this data in the past? In Hurricane Matthew in Florida, they actually requested an individual data set, and it was only, and I think this is a pretty staggering number, in only eight counties that were going to be in impacted by, or anticipated being impacted by Hurricane Matthew, they requested data for that, and that included 45,000 about residents that were identified as electricity dependent and health dependent. They actually were able to do a reverse dial. Um, they can, robo called 45,000 people and had about 17,000 respondents. I, I made a joke that my mother was in the area. They were calling from one o'clock in the morning, telling everybody to get out and go to a shelter. Um, they called at 5 p.m., so I was pretty impressed by 17,000 still responding <laughs> at that point. But 169 individuals immediately identified that they had a medical need and they triaged that and worked with their counties to be able to do outreach to those individuals. So here's a way that data and its, uh, and its um, power to save and protect health is really eminent. Uh, next slide. Another one um, that has been using this data as well significantly is Nevada. And Nevada really was compelled to be, have basically a different type of approach because in 2017 their entire state was under a flood severe flooding um, alert after multiple rainstorms that were unprecedented plus a re, uh, warming up of their snowpack that caused avalanches and also significant flooding from uh, basically snow cap melt melting and that was even before they went into their flooding season and they looked at this data and they used it not only to do outreach to about 300 individuals that they identified, but they were also been using this to try and work with their partners to operationalize the data and use this information in real time to figure out and anticipate and plan for and mitigate where they can impact uh, at-risk populations. They're also using this data also for them to anticipate and plan ahead for their mass care operations. That means sheltering having um, equipment available, but also anticipating the needs of equipment and making approaches and plans to do so and triggers that they can execute in the event of an emergency. Next slide. And then in the historic hurricanes of 2017, um, particularly some people have heard about this, but we were confronted after Hurricane Irma went through and hit the U.S. Virgin Islands with an a catastrophic event. Um, on the first hit for Irma, it literally decimated the hospital and the only two dialysis facilities on the island of St. Thomas. Um, Ir Maria would later hit St. Croix even it, shortly thereafter and also take out pretty much their dialysis capacity and, and also um, local hospital. They only had one on each island. And in doing so, we were we were basically presented with a situation that we had never had before where we had to actually use this data to actually rapidly identify individuals that were, in, for most part, trapped in their homes because of the way the destruction happened um, and basically conduct life-saving outreach and um, evacuation of these individuals. And that was done um, in less than about 24 hours and we were able to save over 235 lives, uh, both from those islands as well. Uh, next slide. So, um, and also just in more recent days, um, just as a, an update to recent, we've also had um, used this in recent her, uh, wildfires, and I know that the discussion in California has come up as well with the emergency shutoff power. Um, the state of California is challenging because we know that there's over 180,000 that are actually electricity dependent and such. So we've been actually working very closely throughout the counties of the state of California, as well as other 
states across the country to try and identify ways that this data can help inform and prepare them. Um, some of the additional resources that we do have um, that I'd like to highlight is that we do offer a free online training program for the program. It's about an hour long. It takes you through the entire program, the tools, the resources, how it's been used, how it can be used, especially for those that are in um, the community that are looking at resilience and, and building uh, community resilience and such. This is actually a pretty helpful um, training that can actually explain this, particularly from the electricity dependent perspective. We also have numerous um, resources available on our um, Empower Map, which we will be updating shortly to allow for more capacity and capabilities with artificial intelligence and such um, to be able to ask questions and find out information, um, all be identified. Um, but we'll be continuing to update and adding more resources and information and training for people that are interested in that as well. And that is, um, next slide is my contact information if you have any other additional questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kristen. And we're now setting up for Morality to talk a little bit about her experience in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here and uh, talk a little bit about our experience on a public, a recent publication that we introduced um, on the critical loads during emergency. Um, and our focus was mainly in uh, a region within uh, Puerto Rico called Hayuya after Hurricane Maria. Um, and I just want to state that I think this project really reflects um, the challenges that the health and power infrastructures face after natural disasters in a very small and localized, personalized scale. Um, on screen, you see some of the team me members um, that were led by Professor Pozo, also from the University of Washington. Um, she grew up in the island and has family there and sort of uh, this motivated um, her to create this project and, and try to see what we can learn, the lessons learned from, from being on ground. Um, okay, so uh, here I just want to highlight where Hayuya is. It is a small um, town in, in the middle of Puerto Rico. And all the preparedness and response that is on on hold for for m many cities and mainland USA may not be as applicable, or there is a lag in response for mountainous areas and remote locations. And so we really wanted to address and learn about what were the challenges facing um, that families dependent on electricity for their medical needs um, really face there. Um, so, as you all know, Hurricane Maria hit in September 27, Category 5, uh, wiped out the whole grid and, and left, um, at, it was an extended outage that is still um, continuing as we learned about in the previous presentations. Um, this is just a, a, to paint the picture before Hurricane Maria, a satellite image of the amount of lights. Ten, eight days um, later, we still couldn't see one single light. Um, so the response time is very slow in this uh, in in this particular situation. Thirteen days later, you could see a little bit of response. So what it actually boils down in, is to this chart that you can see on the left is the energy output restored um, from the hurricane um, six months after. Um, it is still um, like 99%, not 100. And so what what does this mean for families? These are just data points on a chart, but this actually is a representation of all the families that actually have to live without electricity day to day during this period of time. So that is um, what we wanted to focus our um our project on. And we came up with these two categories of patients that rely on, um, that suffer the most during extended out, um, outages. So the first one, we didn't really have any power to, to, to help. So these are considered the severe patients, um, dialysis patients, respiratory uh, problems, oxygen therapy, which would need to be evacuated um, almost immediately because they 
they need a continuous supply of electricity for their therapies. Um, our project was more focused on the second category, which you see are the serious um, patients that can sort of deteriorate their lives um, at, with, without access to power. And so on in our initial project, this is some of the lessons learned, how we focused. Uh, we went through knowing what we needed to plan ahead to, to actually help out this community. And so we needed to know the number of people that were dependent on electricity, um, how can we evacuate or the preparedness to address the situations, um, the electricity required um, by any individual and their capacities, and and so how can we really adapt our um, PV battery systems that we can install to address these issues? So part of knowing what we know, um, talked about earlier in the presentations, is the pros and cons between diesel generators um, versus solar energy systems. Now. Um, we went uh, ahead and did surveys um, for these families on what their knowledge was on either of these two systems and which one they wanted, um, they would prefer to have during these case of emergencies. What also were the barriers implementing these um, this technologies? And so we came up um, two months after Hurricane Maria was our first trip. Um, and as I mentioned before, this blue line reflects the restoration process for the entire um, island of Puerto Rico. But here in the dashed um, black line, you can see the mountainous region and how it's lagging, um, lagging uh, restoration. So that's uh, where we focused our trip. Um, so the first trip was for the preliminary needs, so we were just as observers to grasp the reality on the ground instead of inferring it. And these are just some of the pictures that we saw still two months into into the catastrophe. What we wanted to do was identify patients, conduct interviews to them, and really learn about their, their needs. Um, I, I believe that the information really is the key to designing and planning for better power systems because it reflects um, the personalized or customized needs of every individual or household. And not only from a larger perspective or a l larger national-wide planning um, sort of scale. Um, after we did a, a this extensive analysis of rec recollecting information, we went ahead and designed 21 systems um, that we um, went ahead and deployed there. Just a refresher, this is sort of the connection that um, we wanted to make the PV battery systems and with the battery storage can be standalone and and have the, the um, allow the demand of each household or it could be connected back into the grid. At this point in time, our systems were just standalone. And these are our three systems, two of our own design and production, and one of a commercial system. Um, all of them have different rates of power and are addressed to satisfy different loads for different uh, medical equipment that we've identified in the, in the previous trip. trip. Um, during the installation, it was more of a creative process. This is very small scale, very individualized work that we went ahead and, and installed these systems in, in houses. Um, looking forward into the scalability, we need to address uh, on streamlining um, installations and trying to reduce cost there. And finally, our third trip, um, on our systems, we installed data loggers um, that we that we had um, on our third trip. We went ahead and retrieved all the data collected 
Um, mainly this data was on the energy consumption and genera generation of the PV, um, the PV, the battery degradation and the cycles it went through during use of those from the our third trip I must mention was in July, so of those months between March and July, the load profiles, which items were connected, and this the load pro profiles I'll talk a little bit about them are actually the ones that give us a hint to what the critical loads are. Critical loads, our definition was an open question and was really defined by the users as what they found most critical when they only had limited power. And finally, a survey on the if they wanted more a generator or a solar after having using and experiencing solar um, battery systems. So these are just some plots of six different households we installed our systems in. Um, as you can see, the black lines represent the PV output and the loads um, are, are the blue lines. And you can see that the the load actually hovers uh, right about the the PV output, signifying that they use th these systems to their full capacity. In terms of battery degradation, we wanted to count the the battery cycles that used in order to to predict and forecast battery life. Um, temperatures ma were maintained um, very constant throughout, no no issues there. Um, some households were, were did a different use of their batteries, and at the end will have a different life uh, and usability. So it's more about education on how to use the systems that needs to be in place as well. As for the load profiles, here we see a different um, usage according to their needs. If it's either refrigeration and or entertainment systems, we found out that many connected their TVs. Um, it's a nebulizer and so on. So the recollection of these load profiles, if led to an extensive recollect recollection, can actually lead to a better design of the systems in each individual case and customized. And finally, some of the simulations and results, as I mentioned, now our, quest our research questions from the academic point of view is how to properly size PV battery systems to minimize the cost, um, but still supply the, the power for the critical loads, right? So the information gathered during our, um, our interviews of the load profiles, PV generation that could easily be, um, is easily online, location-based, um, and just the the performance of the batteries and all that we we came up with this the result of this simulation was to extend the cost and predict in one year three years ten years out what are really the cost of having these types of systems versus a generator and I think this graph sums it a little bit. Um, as you can see, the capital cost of having a diesel generator are lower than the PV battery. But through outage times, if you're looking at an extended outage that goes beyond 60 to 65 days, you're really looking at an advantage in cost also from a PV battery system since it doesn't incur in fuel supply and oil changes and maintenance. So when planning ahead, really the scope of how extensive an outage is is of of importance to know which type of system and installation needs to be put in place. And moving forward, um, let's understand that we extended power outage will occur again, um, and we need to improve our understanding of the energy and health dependencies. I think that if we understand the the reliability of medical treatments are only as reliable as the power they run on. So really having that, that risk of having home in-home patients really boils down to can you supply the power for those medical devices in a reliable way. Um, 
as per the research part and the energy part of it, um, accurate, accurate critical load profiles um, and percentages can help us size better the systems, um, either standalone individual house systems or larger microgrids that may go into community centers or small clinics in, in these um, rural areas. And also a, a key factor in the cost is the cost of batteries. And as technology progresses and, and drops the cost, it'll play a major role in the systems. Lastly, I want to thank our sponsors. And you can find our publication in the IEEE Power and Energy magazine. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Moraldi. So we have uh, just a little bit of time left to ask some questions. If I don't get to your question, please feel free to reach out. Additionally, we've got a few indicators of if this is, um, presentation is recorded. It is, and it'll be sent to you. It'll also include um, all the slides, so look for that. You can also access it on our website. One of the first questions that we had, and I'm going to refer to my colleague Todd here, is what type of battery technology uh, is used in the battery storage system for the Vermont project, and what, is that typically what should be used, or are there alternative options? Sure. Um, well, so for that McKnight Lane project, those are lithium-ion batteries supplied by Sonnen, which is a German-based, Germany-based company. Uh, they have a lot of installations all over Europe, and they're moving into the U.S. market. Um, but uh, we're not—I should say—we're not, we're not endorsing a particular battery, a particular manufacturer, or even a particular chemistry. Um, the, the bottom line is that it's important for uh, individuals with critical home health equipment to have access to some way to store electricity so they can run that equipment in case of an outage. And there are many different batteries and chemistries on the market. Uh, when you say lithium ion, there are probably half a dozen um, different lithium ion chemistries that are all grouped under that name that are on the market. They have different characteristics. Uh, and there, is, uh, there are also lead acid batteries. Um, and, and those can be used as well, especially if we're talking about a residential setting where uh, really the battery is there for resiliency purposes. Not, uh, it's not going to be run frequently as it might be in a commercial setting where it's being used for other purposes. So uh, a lead acid battery in that kind of a situation could uh, potentially uh, be just fine. Um, the advantage to lithium ion is that uh, you can cycle it a lot and uh, it has a long life. And so for some commercial applications, you, you want to be able to do that because in addition to resiliency, so for example, for a hospital, in addition to having backup power, they may want to reduce their costs for electricity by reducing demand charges. And so for that purpose, you'd want to cycle those batteries. Uh, in the case of the McKnight Lane project, um, that project, was, those batteries were actually being accessed and are actually being accessed by the local utility to reduce costs of electricity across their service territory for their customers by reducing their peak demand on, on the peak days of the year. And so lithium ion in that case was, was the way to go because they need to be able to cycle those batteries several times a month. But... Um, it really doesn't matter from the point of view of the, the customer uh, who needs backup power for home health equipment. Uh, many different kinds of batteries will, will perform that function. Great. Thanks, Todd. Moraldi, a couple questions for you. One, the first of which is the day 6566 uh, graph that you had up. Is that cumulative? over the life of the battery, or is it indicative of one outage that lasts 60 to 65 days? It's the life of the battery, and also installation costs and other parallel costs are not included. Great, so did you consider in that the life of the battery? Yes. Great, and then finally, um, the TV indicated a lot of people use TVs for it. Was there any sort of pushback for using TVs connected to the batteries? Was it considered a critical health um, device for people who have? How did um, you consider those in the process? 
Sure. So we left the usage open to the users. We advised them to usually use it mainly on their medical devices. But again, we we didn't uh, monitor them as to strictly what they needed to put in. So that gave us an insight on what people, when having limited power, because our systems cannot provide um, power for the whole house, right? So having limited resources uh, of power, what are is, what are they taking advantage of? And all most of them uh, hooked up a TV. Great, thanks. I think we are at the two o'clock mark. Thank you everyone for your great questions. If we didn't get to yours, please feel free to reach out. This is our information if you have any questions and thanks again for attending. We also have some upcoming webinars that I'd like to let everyone know about. Um, they're listed on your screen. We have one this coming Tuesday on EVs and the electricity system, and then one later in July. Um, this webinar will profile a low-income solar plus storage resiliency center in DC, the Maycraft department. So we hope you can join us for those.